Tonight, I want to bring a brief message entitled, When the Church Prays. When the Church Prays. We've come into a season in this nation where the church has to get back to praying. I would argue that there is no shortage of preaching in our nation. I mean, you can go on any podcast, you can go online, anywhere, you can, you can find preaching. But what we are seeing a, a lack of is genuine heart-wrenching prayer. Prayer that moves the hand of God. I heard it said this week in a sermon I was listening to on prayer, that prayer is the, the nerve, the slender nerve that moves the, the hand of the Almighty. When the least of us begins to pray, God begins to move. And I want to, I don't want to rush through tonight and just go through the motions because when the church begins to pray and get serious about prayer, then we will begin to see the power of God in his fullness. Everything in, in my life personally, I know can be attached to prayer, whether it be personal prayer or the prayers of many of you. You know, every time that we're, you know, 6 a.m., I, I, I'm a little selfish when I go in there, I, especially when I'm going to be preaching that day. I stand kind of in the middle <laughs> because I'm hoping that you all pray for me. Let's be honest with you. And Paul, arguably the greatest Christian who ever lived, he, he, when he would write his letters, the epistles, when he'd write to the churches, he'd ask that they'd pray for him. Specific things he'd ask that, they, that they'd pray for him for boldness. Paul didn't know what would happen in the next town that he went to. He, he might be stoned. He might be in prison. He spent most of his ministry in prison. And I want to Tonight, I want to do the best that I can to encourage us as a church to, to be serious about prayer. You know, one of the, the heartbeats of, of our, our ministry here is, is to see people go deeper with God and in intimacy with God. And what I've learned about prayer is that it changes, it changes me more than my circumstances sometimes. And I'm, I'm not going to give you a lucky rabbit's foot tonight. Some people use prayer like that. Some people say, oh, well, let's just let's pray about this. You know, I want you to change my circumstance, God. But oftentimes, God brings circumstances so that we will go to our knees and that he can change us. And um, you want to see a church, uh, you want to see a church shift in, in their get to another gear? Spiritually, it's not removing the opposition. Often we'll, we'll see it in a, in a moment because we're going to look at the church, the, the flagship church, the, the Acts, the book of the Acts, the church found in Acts, the Jerusalem church. Often it's under duress where prayer, it, it gains momentum, right? I don't know about you, but when things are going well in my life, it's more of a struggle to, to, to pray. But when things are difficult, when trials are coming, when I'm in that season, it seems like, you know, prayer, it, it becomes more of a priority. And I wish it were not that way. I wish that we could, we could stay in that, that, uh, that, that focus when it comes to prayer. But tonight, I just want to focus on when the church prays. And there's three areas that I see, uh, and there's many more I could, I could have highlighted tonight, but there's three areas I see in the church of, in the book of Acts that, um, that when they begin to pray, this began to be what they were. This is what took place. I want you to see, first of all, tonight, when the church prays, the church is unified. The church was unified. And I want you to understand tonight that I think one of the biggest hindrances in this country for certain and seeing a mighty move of God is because of the disunity within the church. And when we see in the book of Acts, when they were, were unified, when they begin to pray, there was a, 
a oneness of heart that took place. And I've learned this. One of the most intimate things, men, listen to me tonight. One of the most intimate and masculine things you can do is pray with your wife. And it brings a unity and a closeness that I don't, I don't find in, any, in many other areas. But the same could be said when a church begins to pray, when a group of people set their heart after God and begin to pray together. Oh, there's a unity there. There's not much gossip about somebody you're praying with. There's not much backbiting when a church is praying together. There's not uh, much, uh, there's not this arguing and, and this, this prideful uh, arrogance that you see when a church really begins to pray. And I want you to see in the book of Acts, they were unified. Look at Acts 1 and verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem. So this is right after Jesus had given them instructions to, to wait until the promise of the Spirit would come. And they made their way back to Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James, these all continued in one accord. That's not a Honda, okay? I want you to... <laughs> they were unified in what? In prayer and supplication. Jesus said, not many days hence the Spirit will come. And they didn't know exactly when the promise of the Holy Spirit would come, but Jesus told them to wait. You see, these men realize what I think we don't realize is they, they recognize their emptiness. They recognize that they could not do anything in their, in them, of themselves. They recognize that their resources would not be enough to do what God had called them to do. They realize that they would have to rely on the power of God. You see the church today, uh, it's said that if you were to remove the, the churches today, the Holy Spirit is so far removed that they are going along with their programs, with their sermons, with their activities and you can't tell any difference now uh, between the church and any secular organization. There's no supernatural in our churches anymore today. And may I say it's because the church has stopped emphasizing prayer and, and the, the unity isn't there. They said that they were in one accord in prayer and supplication. There were women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers in that room, I believe, was James, who would become the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. And it was said of James that he had calluses on his knees because he spent so much time in prayer. He had power with God. He was elevated to lead the church. And I think it was not because he was an eloquent, eloquent preacher. I believe we can make the argument because he knew how to pray. And I want to just encourage us, church, in these days, we are going to need to be unified. And how is that going to happen if we never pray together? If we are not on, on one page of one heart and one accord in prayer and supplication. And this is what I think is missing in a lot of, uh, of the churches today. There isn't a prayer service. There isn't an emphasis of, of prayer. So there isn't much unity. You hear of it. I have a friend who serves in a church in town and it's every week he's calling me, telling me about what the deacons are doing against the worship team and, and how there's arguments in the, in the board meetings and how it's just, it's just a mess. And I don't want to listen to it, but he, he says, I don't know who else to talk to about it. <laughs> I really don't. I say, well, I'm praying. And the sad truth is that the churches today, we, we, we aren't seeing the move of God that we could, we could be experiencing because we don't pray. We, don't, we aren't unified in that. But I want to see secondly tonight, when the church prays, the church is energized. The church is energized. And I want you to see 
Jesus made a promise to the church, to the, those disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, one that we also, I believe, can claim for ourselves. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And here he goes again, that the fullness of the Spirit, the power of God on us. You shall receive dunamis power. And, and I want you to get this. This is like the, the, where we get our word dynamite. You know, most churches today, you know, people are in the back and they're yawning during worship and the, the messages fall on deaf ears. And, you know, and, and most Christians life today, there lacks passion, there lacks power, there lacks uh, the evidence of the supernatural. And it's because I believe we are not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The church in Acts, they were, they were energized by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the, is, is the same spirit that lives within you and I. So let me tell you, if, if that, listen to me, if I were to take a, 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 my knife tonight and go over to one of these outlets and put my knife in there, I, will fi- I would feel the power. The other day, my... <laughs> There was an outlet in the boys' room and, uh, about a few months ago, and, and um, the space heater somehow got wonky, and, and, and there was a black smoke that came, and you know how it was. And, and I was just explaining to my kids, like, this is, you know, this is nothing to mess with. You see, this power that we live in and these, these creature comforts that we enjoy because of the power, you know, it's, it's great. But let me tell you something. Don't mess with that power because I have one boy who's very adventurous, very you know, curious, and he has been known to stick things in the, in the wall. But I'm telling you, if we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, why is it that we fail miserably when it comes to when we're tempted with sin. Why is it that we we aren't witnesses? You see, listen to me. Jesus said that the power would come upon them so that they would be witnesses to him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the ends of the earth. And we know that it was said about this these people that the world was turned upside down by these people because of the power of the Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I want to experience the fullness of the power of the Spirit in my life and in our church, too. We don't, we say this all the time, but we, we, we're not here to play church. We're not here to go through the motions. Hey, if that were the case, we could all be at home, you know, just kicking our feet up and doing something else. But the truth of the matter is, church, what, what I believe your hearts are here, Wednesday night crowd, is to see the fullness of God's power. I want you to see in Acts chapter 2, they waited on God, but while they waited, they prayed. And that's why I believe we are in this season. We're waiting on God. We're praying for revival. And in this time, we've got to uh, have faith and we've got to be faithful and, and praying and seeking him because one day his power, I truly believe, is going to fall. And I want to be here. That's not, I don't want to be uh, you know, uh, absent on that day when the Spirit of God shows up. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were, with all, they were all with one accord. Listen, they were unified. They were in one place. One commentary said they were gathered together, sharing the same heart, the same love for God the same trust in his promise and the same geographic location. You know what would happen? If, if everyone in this church had a heart for God that was set on fire, you know what would happen? You know, do you want to be the person that is hindering the move of God? I believe the Holy Spirit moves up and down a, a church like this and and I believe as he goes across, sometimes maybe he's quenched. I heard of a, a little little lady in this church who said that she was at a meeting greet a few months ago and, and a former employer of hers didn't like that she had left the job and he's coming here to this church too. 
And she went to say hi to him and he just walked away. She won't tell me his name because I would be having a conversation. (laughs) I'm telling you, the Spirit of God can be quenched and we think it's something to, to take lightly. I was reading through Acts and I was reminded of Ananias and Sapphira and how the, the, the fear of God was on the church and he was moving and signs and wonders and then they got it in their head. They were prideful. They wanted to get recognition. They wanted to, to be seen as more spiritual than they were and they, they lied against the Holy Spirit and ooh, would it... We know what happened. They both were dead within the day. And we got serious about this thing. We got the same heart, the same love. If we sought holiness, we sought to be set apart. We were serious about prayer. What could God do on the backside of the desert here in Leona Valley? But the day was fully come. They were all in with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house while they were sitting. And then there appeared to them the divided tongues and as a fire. And one set on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance, you say, oh no, Pastor, are we, are we gonna, is this what we wanna see? Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna, I'm telling you, and we've been saying this, and I think we, we, we're prophetic in this. I think that we are preparing you because when the Spirit of God falls, it's not gonna look like we, it's not gonna be comfortable. It's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to keep it in our neat little theological boxes. And I'm telling you, this church was energized when the Holy Spirit fell on them that day. The sign gift that was given for them was to speak in tongues, and you could read the rest on your own time, but you understand, you remember what happened. They went out in the boldness of this, in the fullness of the Spirit. And they spoke the, the good news of the gospel in, in, in different tongues and languages because there were men from all over the known world there uh, who had come to observe uh, the, the feast. And, and they all heard the gospel in their own language. And I'm telling you, when someone is energized, when someone is filled with the spirit, you know what the main fruit from this will be? Boldness to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's something different when a man or a woman is filled with the Spirit and they proclaim the the, the boldness uh, and boldness, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's power. I was thinking about Billy Sunday and his testimony, uneducated, former pro athlete. And and then God got a hold of that man. And God used him across this nation in and, and revivals and, and, and many, many, arguably hundreds of thousands of people gave their hearts to Christ in his ministry. But it was said that uh, he would, his language was rough, it was rough. His, 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 he couldn't, to prepare a sermon, it was a struggle. He didn't have all the tools and, and, and he was not the most polished. He was not a lot of things. But what that man did have was the power of God on him. And would be to God, we get back to being the church where the power of God rests on us. And it doesn't really matter what your educational background is. It doesn't really matter what you may know from Scripture. I'm telling you, and what matters is do you have the power of the Holy Spirit on you? Oh, I'm telling you. Somebody needs to hear this and the church needs to be energized once again. We need to wait. I'm telling you, don't witness until you know you have the power of God on you. Don't try to be a wife until you know you got the power of God on you. Don't try to lead your family and husband unless you know you got the Holy Spirit on you. I'm telling you because you'll do far more damage than you do good. I'm telling you, those kids do not need to see religion. They need to see the power of God and experience him. 
This is why kids can walk away from church because they're not experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, if our kids would experience, I saw these kids down here today and it just joys my heart. These kids are experiencing the presence of God. And I'm telling you, it's stronger than fentanyl. It's stronger than the addiction of of joy. I'm telling you, he's more. And so we've got to be praying for that. You know, my number one prayer for my kids is that they experience God. Not that they know the, 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 the <laughs> they know how to quote scripture. Not that they uh, they've been you know just had the reform on the outside. They have the form of godliness that we hear about in in the, in the New Testament. That there was people who had a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. There's too many men in this church. You have form, but you have no fire. And your wives can t- t- test attest to that. You have no fruit because you have form. You know your theological positions are, are, are right and as straight as a gun barrel, but you're empty. There's no dunamis power. There's no energy. God help us, church. When the church prays, the church is energized. But I want to see last tonight. When the church prays, the church is multiplied. The book of Acts records the the explosive growth of the church of Jerusalem. Now they were they were in a, they were in disobedience because God had given them that commission. Jesus told them to go. You know, it's not for everyone to stay in Jerusalem and have this big mega church. <laughs> it was estimated that the church was over 100,000 at some point. And God had to bring in persecution. God had to allow persecution to come to scatter them out. And often you'll see that throughout the history of Christianity. I was listening today to a, a message and the preacher was talking about uh, a, a leader, I forget his name, I wish I should have wrote it down, who said that the more Christians that they killed, the more popped up. <laughs> Christianity explodes under persecution. Hey, hey, maybe I'm wrong. You know, I have little kids, so I want you to understand what I'm saying here, but it, it might be good for us to see some persecution here. Because what it does is it shakes the tree. It takes the it, 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 the line has been the line is drawn in the sand and, and and the real Christians begin to stand up. It was told of when Hitler was going on his conquering there in 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 Europe, he made the preachers sign allegiance to him, and and um, there were eight hundred pastors and preachers who refused to sign, and they all were put. In internment camps, and, and while they're in those camps, uh, there was revival sparking. There were souls being saved. There were there was a dramatic uh, events taking place in the prisons because these preachers would not sell out, even if it meant their necks. And then the church was multiplied under the difficult. Circumstances. I want you to see Acts chapter 2. Then those, after uh, the Spirit came and, and empowered them, energized them, there was uh, a time, of course, Peter preached a sermon, and there were those who received Christ. Were, the Bible says 3,000 souls were added unto them that day of Pentecost. Talk about explosive growth. Imagine my arm was a little tired. Y'all saw Drew get baptized, that six, seven boy, uh, man, excuse me, on Sunday. That was a hard one. I couldn't lift them up after I I need to get back in the gym. But can you imagine those having to baptize 3,000 people? And it happened that day. There were ceremonial washing pools all throughout Jerusalem. And so I can imagine the scene as 3,000 men and women were baptized The church was multiplied, and the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Oh, they they were hungry for for the truth. They 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 were they were 
they were eating it up and they were steadfast in it. They were studying the word and the apostles' doctrine and they also, they fellowshiped. They spent time with one another. Some of you, you don't, you don't do life with anyone else of the faith. We, we have our tribe and we have our, you know, our own little group and, and that's it. It was not so. There was no cliques, I believe, in this church. In doctrine and fellowship and in breaking and bread, they, 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 you know, when I was a Baptist, we, we really emphasized that because every, every other week we had a potluck and there was casseroles everywhere, you know? Here we're talking about fasting a lot more, right? <laughs> hey, I balanced it. See, I, t- I told Pastor, I balanced you out in so many ways. You're the John the Baptist who you, you're good eating locusts and honey in the wilderness and fasting and doing all that. Hey, you'll catch me at Chick fil A. I was at Chick fil A the other day. And three other church members were there, like, hey, Pastor, hey. It's like, hey. No, I need to get that in, in, in check, but. <laughs> About, yeah, one guy from the fire department didn't know he went to this church. He's, he talked to to me for an hour. <laughs> I couldn't even eat my food. He wanted to talk to me, tell me about everything was going on in his life, but God bless him. <laughs> I'm going to get my food to go next time, yeah. <laughs> We're going to break bread another time, but anyhow. But I want you to see that they, they continued in prayers. They prayed together. You've probably heard this, the family that prays together stays together. That's, that's true for the church as well. The Bible says, then fear came upon every soul. They had a holy uh, reverence for God, every soul. They didn't want to grieve the Spirit of God. And, and there was an atmosphere where God could work. That's an atmosphere where God can move. His Spirit can, can have free reign. It says, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. We see in Acts chapter 6 that there was a problem that came up. There was a complaint that came by the Hellenists, by the Greeks, about the Hebrews, and their widows were being neglected. And the disciples, they understood that they had a calling on them to to, to, to be in the Word. They had a, 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 a purpose that God had given them to, to minister the Word to these people. They couldn't leave to to serve the tables, so they, they sought out for seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy, listen to this, full of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget this a few years back, and maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I remember Pastor Shane was, was convicted, and, and just, we had some deacons who we'd never see them at prayer. We'd never see them, you know, midweek service. We'd never see them. And so I remember we we just put it out there, hey, we'd like to see you guys at least once a month at the prayer meeting. And I remember all hell broke loose with a few of them for us saying that. And I'm telling you, <laughs> God did some shaking. Some left and to never return. I love them and I pray for them till this day. But I want you to know, we, we don't need an elder. We don't need a pastor. We don't need a deacon who isn't about that life. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. Listen to me. Who is not about that life of seeking God. And I'm not saying every week. We're not taking attendance. We're not. Don't get me wrong. I'm not there in the back like, who's here today? I'm not doing that. What I'm saying is we if we never see you, then you don't need that title. And if you're convicted by this, maybe this is what you need to hear. And, and you might, I might get... Anyway, anyway, I'll leave it there. But these men were of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that they may appoint over this, wisdom, this, this business. And I want you to see, this is what a deacon is. A deacon isn't the person that keeps the pastor in check necessarily. <laughs> A deacon is someone who serves. That means servant. And the pastor's a servant, too. Don't get me wrong. We're not on a, any high pellet stool here. I'm just 
the loud mouth, like Pastor says, who has to be up here, and this is what God's called me to do. But however, we serve the most people. My phone is, my, I'm never off. I'm going to be honest with you. And so this is what they did. They said, we're going we're gonna to look for these men, these type of men with these qualifications. And may I say this, a deacon should have the same, has just about the same qualifications as a pastor. And he says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer. This convicted me. He said, but we, the pastors, the leaders of the church, we will give ourselves. What does it mean to give yourselves to to continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This convicted the fire continually. This means these men, I don't know if they're empty nesters, I don't know, because obviously they didn't have five kids at home. Even though I'm continually praying not to, (laughs) not to lose my cool with one of them at all times. But I'm thankful tonight, my kids are home, a couple of them had fevers this weekend. But my wife called me, and, and then little Zuri look, comes on the phone and said, Dad, we pray for you tonight. A little boy, Dad, we pray for you <laughs> I said, thank you, baby. And um, I hope this convicted me. I'm just going to say this, because I need to pray more. I, I need to give myself continually. If I'm going to give myself continually, some of you, you give yourself continually for Lockheed. Some of yourself, I know you got to work. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying quit your job. <laughs> I'm just listening to me. You got to, because you're worse than an infidel if you don't provide for your family. I'm just saying, if you work for them for 10 hours, why can't we give God an hour? And we're all guilty of this. Because we'll give, you know, TikTok and Instagram and Cinemark and Netflix, we'll give them hour after hour after hour. But he said, we, we can't leave. This is, this is important, but this is the priority. These widows are very important. Don't get me wrong, but this is what God has called us to. And, you know, one of the things that God has reminded me studying for this is that that's what I should be. I should be continually giving myself to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And um, the Bible says that the saying pleased everyone. They called out these men. And, and the Bible says, and when they had prayed and laid hands on them, then the word of God spread. Listen to that. Then the word of God spread because they were unified and energized. And now they would be multiplied because they prayed and they let God direct them. And they had men of prayer who they appointed as deacons. And now the word of God was not hindered. And the number of the disciples, listen to this, multiply. I like multiplication more than addition when it comes to investments. I like multiplication more than addition when it comes to children. I got a lot of those, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying to you, multiplication, things add up quicker than it does with additions. And uh, this is what it said. The church multiplied greatly, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Ian Bound said this, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, or better machinery, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men and women who the Holy Ghost can use men of prayer, men and women mighty in prayer. And uh, I want you to see this church was multiplied not only locally, but in the missions aspect. Look at Acts, and we're almost done. We're done tonight. Acts 13. I don't know if I got this one in time. Yeah, there we go. This is the church in Antioch now. This is a little ways away from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, but there were certain prophets and teachers. The Apostle Paul was a part of this church in Antioch. Barnabas, one of my favorite people in the Bible, an encourager, he, he was there. Simeon this was, um, was there. Lucius of Cyrene. It was a multicultural church. There were, there were those who were from all over in this church and the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, they believed they were praying. 
the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. See, I've learned this, a church that prays, a church that's unified, a church that's filled with the Holy Spirit and his energy, people are going to be called to go out and spread that fire. You know, one of the things that I pray for for our church is that God would raise up other men and women of God, that missions would begin to explode from this church. Would be to God that God would call someone in the team and ignite to be a missionary. That that would excite me more than your son going pro. You, you spend hours and hours <laughs> and money, and, and, and I'm beyond Jason looking at me, he's a coach. I understand. If your son goes pro, I expect tickets. I expect to go and see that. Don't get me wrong. I want to see him play. But let me tell you what. I'll jump a little higher personally. If my child or your child is called to bring the gospel to a foreign country or to plant a church here in the U.S. This is the mission field now. Y'all know that. But you know, the church was multiplied. The church was energized. The church was unified. When the church prayed. 